Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It is Friday, the Rotary Club of Fort Worth, and, and even though we still have a long lunch line, we have such a full schedule that we just got to get going. Welcome. Uh, I, you know, we've already been, your Rotary Club has already been out this morning. I was privileged, as always, uh, to attend the Fort Worth Police Department graduation. And for class 154, there's a few photos somewhere coming up on here. And uh, the honor grad this cycle was Kevin Cantu, and he will be joining us for lunch shortly. Uh, today, following our invocation given by Maddie Compton, the international leadership of Texas Keller Saginaw High School Marine Corps Junior Reserve Officer Training Corps Armed Color Guard. We'll present the colors, followed by Harriet Harrell with the National Anthem. So now, Maddie Compton, retired U.S. Attorney, please lead us with the invocation. Please pray with me. Supreme being, we are gathered here today, a body of diverse people and faiths, invoking your presence in our midst as we seek to answer affirmatively the questions of our four-way test. We thank you for the harvest of blessings you have given that, it may, that make it possible for us to stand in this space. We thank you for the unmerited mercy and grace you have extended to us, looking beyond our faults and seeing our needs. And we thank you for the opportunity in the 1,440 minutes we have this day to be your hands and feet in service to our community. Guide us in seeing, speaking, and hearing with our hearts. For you have shown us what is good and required of us to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with you. Amen. Amen. Forward, march. Mary, color. Ready, cut. Present, arm. Thank you, cadets. You all may please be seated. What a beautiful way to start our Memorial Day celebration. Uh, and now, 
If I could please have Steve Kessler, financial advisor with Morgan Stanley, join us to welcome our guests and visiting Rotarians. Thank you, President Sean, appreciate that. If y'all could um, join me in welcoming our guests today. And um, as I call your name, if you could stand up and be recognized, we would appreciate that. First guest is Lauren Hawker, a guest of Bob Vargo. Thank you. Our next guest is Corey Harris, a guest of Connie Blake. And we also have Dallas Liu, guest of Elliot Goldman. Next guest is Viviana Martinez, a guest of Julie Butner. We also have Shadi Kalani, a guest of Jason Ray. Another guest of Bob Vargo, we have Catherine Hawker. Uh, we also have Jiminique Schuler, a guest of Kay Bryant. And finally, but not least, Christine Jones, a guest of Elliot Goldman. From the greatest, greatest gift catalog. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Welcome to all of you. And while I don't have a fun fact on each one of our visitors, I do have a few on young Dallas Lou over here. I found out that Dallas is an L.A. actor in town and he was in or he's got an upcoming movie, Avatar, The Last Air. I can't read my writing. Bandit? Bender. 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 That's coming out next April. And then he's also in another Marvel um, movie now. So line up and get the autographs right here. <laughs> Thank you to our sponsor today, Randall Howard. R.D. Howard Roofing is part of R.D. Howard Construction based in Fort Worth, Texas since 1946. R.D. Howard Roofing does hail and storm damage claims for homeowners, churches, apartments, and businesses with free roof inspections. Refer someone and R.D. Howard will pay you or donate to your favorite nonprofit, like this Rotary Club. Call Tracy Marshall, write this down, 817-729-6314. Thank you again, R.D. Howard Roofing. And now, our four-way test. As is our tradition, we recite this around the world, and not necessarily all Rotarians, but many or even most do the very same thing at their meetings. So together, first, is it the truth? Two, is it fair to all concern? Three, will it build goodwill and better friendships? And finally, will it be beneficial to all concerned? And without further delay, there's a gal that loves to do a Snoopy dance. Michelle Krim, she's our newscaster today. She's president of Dynamic Development Strategies. I feel as welcome as cobbler. Is it a bread pudding on the dessert table? Okay, guys, welcome to another Girls Gone Mild edition of the newscast. I got to laugh, Girls Gone Mild. You like that one? All right, here we go. Here's our national holidays, National Pizza Party Day, National Bike to Work Day, Walk Safely to School Day, National Devil Food Cake Day, and y'all, once again, every day is do not reply all to your emails. You know who you are. <laughs> All righty, Mike Lindell, better known as the My Pillow Guy, is saving up to buy a Supreme Court justice. <laughs> Quote, I've always wanted to own my own Supreme Court justice, he said. I realize I better jump on it while there's still some left on the market. <laughs> well, unfortunately, his pillow business is tanking. So he said, quote, the most I can afford is a bargain basement, Supreme Court justice in a beat up condition, he said. I'm gonna to have to settle for Kavanaugh. <laughs> you know, I think he's been sleeping on the wrong side of the bed and reading too many John Grissom novels. Yes. Alrighty, there was a body discovered in the freezer of Louisiana Arby's. Police in Louisiana are investigating what they call, quote, the suspicious death even for Louisiana, <laughs> of a female RB employee's who body was found in the business freezer. Quote, a situation like this is unusual, so we're taking extra precautions, police said. 
Now, after completely, completely processing the crime scene, this does not seem like a homicide, just an accident. Now, Arby's has recently updated their taglines from slicing up freshness, true, to we got the meats, to we got the meats and the feats. I told you there would be groans. All righty, officials from the Kansas Department of Wildlife and Parks came across a fishy situation last week after finding a firearm allegedly being used to fish. This was Kansas, not Texas. <laughs> a game warden sees a nine millimeter handgun that was quote, being used to take fish in Garden City. Now the, the warden said they had to do a written violation that was issued for quote, illegal means of taking up a fish and no fishing license. They also reminded people that firearms are not a legal means to take fish. Bystanders were also warned against aiding and abating bait in the sharpshooting fishermen. Okay, y'all are gonna have to look at the next couple of one of these. All right, bad signs. Next in East Texas, the signs are clear that slow moving children may only be hunted with shotguns. Oh yeah. All right, next, over in the feminine hygiene aisle, you two can have your very own pool float in a super absorbent material that keeps you dry all day. <sighs> Cake, anyone? Especially for a one-year-old's birthday party. <laughs> yeah, that's Emma, if you want to know. All righty, a suspected drunk driver tries to trade up, sorry, tries to trade seats with his dog to avoid arrest. <laughs> A driver who was pulled over for speeding tried to switch places with his dog to avoid arrest, police in Colorado said. An officer watched him maneuvering inside the car before he got out on the passenger side and then ran off, leaving his dog in the driver's seat. He was quickly caught, taken to the hospital, and then arrested on, shocker, suspicion of driving under the influence of alcohol and or drugs, also driving while ability is impaired, as well as for previous warrants for his arrest. You know, you gotta feel for the dog. In the dog's defense, he was having a rough day <laughs> and was really ticked off that his owner pawed off the driving to him. And finally, <laughs> yes, friends, we have finally gone to the dogs and we might be barking up the wrong tree. Bobby, has been certified as the world's oldest dog by the Guinness Book of World Records. Bobby, who is a Portuguese pooch, celebrated his 31st birthday recently. Happy birthday, Bobby. Now, I know you're probably wondering, how old is Bobby in dog years? Well, scientists have determined that one dog year is really not equal to seven human years. In fact, the only thing equivalent to seven human years was the year 2020. <laughs> have a great weekend. Hey, here's one special announcement. There's a phone, a lovely iPhone that's black. It was up there by the sign-in table on the floor. I'll keep it with me and we know whose it is. Very good. And uh, now we have a very special announcement. Don Click, broker with Don Click Real Estate. Please join me. Or how, how are we, how, what happens next? We have a very special guest today by the name of Jack Stowe. I don't want to let the let the surprise out. He is a World War II veteran. Thank you very much. Uh, I had the interesting way to meet Jack Stowe here recently. Some of us regularly go to the American Legion and you wear your hat and you start the conversation. My name's Don. I served 69 to 73 in Trepid and Forrestal. 
Jack across the table just says, I'm Jack, Guadalcanal, 1943. It is my privilege to present Jack. Uh, Robert Lane is Stephanie's district director. So we have a uh, Texas flag from Representative Click to present to him and a certificate that goes with it. Uh, and we want to thank you for your service and your continued efforts uh, on behalf of veterans. I do want to take just three sentences because I had to look up a little history on Guadalcanal and I know time is short. The Japanese lost more than 24,000 in the campaign while the combat losses were only 1,600 killed for the US and 4,200 wounded. But the naval losses were two heavy carriers, six heavy cruisers, two light cruisers, 14 destroyers. Japanese lost three heavy cruisers, a light carrier, a light cruiser, 11 destroyers, and six submarines. That was February of 1943. Jack did get malaria while he was in Guadalcanal, and we want to recognize those veterans. This is the month of Memorial Day. Thank you again, Jack. Well, it was a different time then. Uh, everybody rushed down to join. I was 15 years old when I went in. I crossed the equator when I was 16. I was headed for the, on a, you get a sell back certificate when you cross the equator. And uh, on it, it says uh, at that date, the 1st of January, 1943, where he's headed for the war zone in the South Pacific. We didn't know where we were going. But that area is called Iron Bottom Bay because of all the ships that he mentioned or some there's nicknamed if you went on the internet, Iron Bottom Bay in the South Pacific. It showed you Tulagi where Kennedy was. I was four miles from him. I used to watch him on the PT boats as they come roaring out going on their runs. But uh, I served two years over there and two years in the States. I was in four years. And I, I thank you. I'm 96, I'll be 97 my birthday. <laughs> Well done. Thank you, Mr. Stowe. So well done. What a privilege to have you with us today. We, we know that term, the greatest generation, but is it not true? And the torch has been so capably passed to all of us, and may we do as well. Now, the next announcement, with summer just around the corner, a very special community spotlight, Pam Cannell, President and CEO, Board Development Systems, and Derek Moffitt, Principal and Financial Advisor, Moffitt Financial Strategies, National Drowning and Prevention Alliance information. Thank you very much. Good to be here today. Imagine that it's a hot August day, and uh, you go with your friend and their uh, her three children to the swimming pool in no far north Texas, or I mean, I'm sorry, far north Fort Worth. And uh, the middle child comes to you and says, hey, mom, can I have a slice of, of watermelon? She turns for a moment to get, bring that piece of watermelon out, looks back at the pool and has lost sight of her son who she can no longer see because there's a fountain, an elephant fountain uh, spouting up water and a lazy river that's coming around. And at the point where the line of vision is obstructed, it drops from two feet to four feet. Xander, at that time, then lifts up his best friend, four years old, three years old, and holds her up so that she can catch a breath. Both of those children uh, suffered submersion injury. Uh, they pulled both of the children out. A Cook Children's nurse was there, was able to eventually revive the three-year-old, and Xander stayed on life support for three days uh, before he finally passed. So that is one story that has driven my passion 
and Derek's passion to serve on the National Drowning Prevention Alliance Board of Directors. And we're grateful for the opportunity to speak with you today about uh, Water Safety Month, May, and what you can keep in mind. Now imagine you're a parent again. This is a 16-year-old and they live in uh, North Richland Hills. This 16-year-old is a track star at the Oak Ridge School. He goes with his family to Possum Kingdom Lake with another family, and as soon as he arrives, he calls back home to mom and says, uh, we've arrived, I'm gonna go for a swim, and, uh, and he dives in right before he hangs up. He says, I love you, mom, and that's the last thing he ever told his mom. Both of these are stories of people within this community. In April 2021, the United Nations declared drowning the number one preventable cause of deaths worldwide. In the United States, drowning is the leading cause for children ages one through four. For children ages five through 14, it is the second leading cause of unintentional injury deaths behind motor, motor vehicle crashes. In Texas, 76 children drowned in 2022. Now 76 is the number it takes to fill one school bus. So imagine that, one school bus, 76 children. Over eight times that amount suffered injuries from a non-fatal drowning, with many having lifelong injuries, emotional trauma, and financial hardship. A little bit closer to home, my wife and I, Jennifer, visited Wyatt in Cook's Children's Hospital. Wyatt's a 17-month-old who came up to this area to visit his grandparents for Easter and drowned in a koi pond. He's been in a coma ever since uh, Easter and fighting for his life. I do find hope in the UN statement that drowning is preventable, preventable, and there's a lot that every one of us can do to help prevent drownings and save lives. And to piggyback on that hope, one of the things that I enjoy doing most in the summer is volunteering my time for the Fort Worth Drowning Prevention Coalition where I teach adults and children to learn to swim. And there was one occasion where a grandmom had enrolled her seven-year-old grandson into swim lessons. And at the end of that season, uh, we always give a life jacket to these children. Well, that evening, the child, his mom and his grandmom went to New Brunfels to go tubing. And unfortunately, he did fall off of his tube, as did his mother. His mother went down. She did not know how to swim. He flipped on his back with the life jacket that we had provided him, kicked to the side of the uh, river, and a gentleman pulled him out and said, you did fantastic. And he said, well, I did what they taught me in water safety lessons. That's how you prevent a drowning. Thank you both for that critical message. Texas is one of the deadliest states for child pool and spa drownings. And now we have new member introductions. In the interest of time, I'm gonna ask all four of our pairs to please approach the stage. First, Adolph Aguirre, proposer, past president, Jim Whitten, followed by Tejas Rain, proposer, Jared Williams, then Kaylee Scott, proposer, Kathy Sheffield, and finally, Bar Bob Vargo, proposer, Frank Shields. Jim, take it away. Well, as you just heard, many people pronounce the last name of our new member, Aguirre. It's actually Aguirre. And if you can trill your R's, it's Aguirre. <laughs> but he came here to Fort Worth to reestablish the Fort Worth chapter of the American Red Cross. It's now the DFW Metro West chapter. Some of you remember when we used to have our own chapter, but the Red Cross a few years ago decided to combine it with Dallas. Well, he's going to bring it back. And to do it, Mr. McGuire is going to have to be honest, intelligent, empathetic, energetic, charismatic, tenuous, tenacious, and kind. He perfected those qualities in his previous post as the executive director of the uh, Salvation Army in McAllen and in Laredo before that, and that's where he first joined Rotary. Of course, he developed those qualities at an early age because his first name's Adolf. <laughs> So, and that's not the only thing he's had to overcome. He was born in Dallas. <laughs> Do not hold that against him, please. I mean, he left there, he came here, he's here to help us. So please welcome our new member, Adolph Aguirre. <laughs> 
So as Jim mentioned, uh, I left 24 years ago to go to uh, seminary to become a minister. Uh, I came back uh, to DFW Metroplex and uh, now I'm a nonprofit director. So how that happened, I don't know, uh, but it's given me the opportunity to live in Atlanta, Georgia, Marietta, Georgia, Wilmore, Kentucky, uh, Central Texas in Kerrville, uh, Tyler, Texas, McAllen, Laredo. Uh, so I've been all over the place and I'm hoping that this is my final stop. <laughs> so uh, I just enjoy it. I would have preferred to come from Atlanta to here and then not really complain about the traffic. So thank you. Thank you, welcome. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, come on, my dad's a Southern Baptist pastor, so you'll have to talk back to me. Good afternoon, everyone. That is more like a Southern Baptist church. Um, I have the privilege of introducing a dear friend of mine, uh, Tejas. Um, he serves with me at the Terranary Food Bank as our Vice President of Innovation and Integration. Um, and one of the first conversations we had was for our love of Rotary. Um, he actually comes to us from Addison by way of uh, the Northeast, but he was a member in the Addison Rotary Club. Um, at the Terranary Food Bank, he does so many amazing things for us. Um, he is probably one of the most innovative thinkers that I've ever met. <laughs> Um, next to my dad and so I am so incredibly proud uh, to get to know him um, just to give you some fun facts about him um, he is a founder of a fraternity which is a really big deal um, he also had uh, earned his bachelor's of science from Syracuse University um, his master's of science in systems engineering management from the University of Texas and he recently just got accepted into the executive MBA program at Cornell University so if that doesn't say that he's an innovative thinker I don't know what will but more than that he is committed to community and making a difference um, in every community that he's been in. So um, I introduce to you some and present to a few uh, Tages. Thank you. all uh, Thank you, Jerry, for that uh, lovely introduction. So thank you very much. Um, it's an honor to be here. Um, being, being, being a Rotary member has been a great uh, privilege. Um, it's been a great journey for me for three years being part of uh, the Rotary Club at Addison. So I'm really looking forward to being able to part of, being able to be part of this group and being able to serve the community that we're uh, working with. Um, and a fun fact uh, for me is I've been to 36 states in the United States, so wow. got a few more to go. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a really good. This one. <laughs> Thank you very much. If you know me, then you know that I can pretty much talk to a brick wall for a couple hours. Um, and I had the opportunity to talk with this beautiful brick wall um, in an elevator one day, many, many months ago. She's not a brick wall, she's more than that. Um, but if you're in the elevator with me, you know I talk with everybody. Um, but this is Kaylee uh, Scott. We met in the elevator at the Fort Worth Club. She was a brand new member and all these folks were coming onto the elevator and coming up to the 12th floor and she said, where is everyone going? Now she's a member. Um, so Kaylee is uh, the founder and president of Routine Clean, and it's, it's a commercial cleaning company. And she grew up in Arlington and she went to Martin High School. She was very active in the chamber choir and she got to perform at Walt Disney Concert Hall and the ACDA at Carnegie Hall which is a pretty interesting fact. She graduated from Tarleton State University with a bachelor's degree in psychology, and she's currently an executive MBA uh, student at Texas Christian University. She's also a Neely mentor there. And she's a member of the Fort Worth Real Estate uh, Council and Commercial Real Estate Women's Network. But her hobbies include strongman competitions, drum circles, and dancing. And she told me, because I wasn't sure if she had children or if she had ever been married, but she said she's footloose and fancy free. She has no pets. <laughs> Thank you for that. I'm a little short too. Um, hi, I'm Kaylee. I am honored to uh, be a part of Rotary and I'm excited to start volunteering with you all. And a fun fact about me is I rode a bull before. Oh, very wow. Impressive. wow. Here you go. Thank oh, you thank you. Thank much. you. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you, Robert. Hello, it's my pleasure to welcome Bob Vargo. Bob and I first met while he was still playing the drums for Leonard Skinner. Oh no, that's a lie. <laughs> no, 
Bob, uh, Bob and I met through uh, Trinity alumni uh, events and, and fraternity events. And, uh, and so we're really glad to have him. Um, he uh, grew up in Houston. And uh, when he was at Trinity, he got a degree in Russian. Is that right? Oh. Okay. <laughs> and uh, he moved to Calgary, uh, Alberta, and was there for 27 years. Raised two kids in a ski racing family and was president of the Bow Valley Quickies Ski Club. Hmm, that sounds interesting. <laughs> and uh, he's married to Catherine. Uh, married to uh, married Catherine in 2016, and she's sitting right here. And uh, and then he uh, had the pleasure of raising her two kids, which he calls calls his bonus kids. Absolutely. And uh, Catherine's uh, daughter Lauren is here too, to support Bob. Uh, finally, Bob realized that uh, they were wasting a lot of time during hibernation in Canada, and decided it was best to move down south. So here they are uh, in Texas. Bob is currently president of Resin Technology. So take it away, Bob. Uh, thanks, Frank. Thanks, <clears throat> President Sean. Appreciate everybody being here. Um, two things real quick. Uh, living in Calgary, it's known as Cowtown. So I'm one of the fortunate people that able to live and work in two cow towns now. Uh, my introduction to Rotary actually happened about 10 years ago right now. Um, Lauren came home one day from school and said, there was this Rotary Club that wants to send a student abroad. Uh, she ended up being an exchange student in Madrid for a year in 2013, 2014, and it was really an important event in her life. Uh, so much so that Catherine and I took in a couple of students, uh, one uh, Anton from Spain, or sorry, from uh, Sweden, and uh, Carlos Rubin from Mexico. So uh, we're uh, very excited, very fortunate, very um, uh, honored to be part of the organization here. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. We're so delighted to have all, all four of you. And now, without further ado, let me introduce the chairman of the day for today's program, Deborah Jung, Executive Director, Kids Who Care. Here we go. What a delight when I got the list of the people I get to introduce, knowing three of them was wonderful and getting to know John now by introducing him and looking at his uh, life information is such a delight. So we'll start with John Shear, who is the executive director of Academy 4. John has served in Academies 4 as the executive director since 2019, and he oversees the operations of Academy 4 and administration of programs. He works with the board of directors to identify and execute strategic goals, of course, oversees director level staff and works to build and expand community partnerships. Before becoming Academy of Four's executive director in 2017, John Shear was VP of product development with Presidium, a national leader in abuse risk management, helping hundreds of organizations help keep children safe, touched my heart. Shear's prior experience in corporate learning and development and organizational development is something we could all learn from. He is a proud graduate of Texas Tech with degrees in economics and technical communication. Welcome, John. Vanessa Rohr, and I have to add to that Taylor Willis, who's sitting next to her. Vanessa Rohr will be on stage. What you don't know about the two of them is that they have spent a lot of time in the kitchen here as members of Kids Who Care's touring and resident company, and we won't ask them to do improv for you or a step touch, but they're very familiar with this room in terms of entertaining all of you as kids. Um, Vanessa Barker is a Fort Worth native and a proud product, to, and I would agree to be proud of being a Fort Worth ISD public school kid and is the co-founder along with Taylor Willis of the Wellman Project. After graduating from Emerson in Boston with a BA in Arts Management, she went to teach at a preschool in the hills of Topanga, California, and I love that she says, and the other hills in San Francisco. So someone who has an arts management degree who chooses preschool is a special soul. Vanessa 
has been a project manager for events around the country, and I knew when these were happening. So listen to what she did. Great ice wall on the Hudson River in charge of production management, New York Fashion Week, and really, guys, Glitter Runways, a Victoria's Secret fashion show prepares you for a lot of things. <laughs> it was the combination of teaching and event experience that led Vanessa to the idea of the Wellman Project and her migration back to Fort Worth to see hundreds of thousands of dollars in an event that was wasted led to this brilliant idea of recycling all the things that a lot of people throw away. Along with her best childhood friend, Taylor Willis, she spends her days, and I adore this, saving materials from the landfill and reproducing those items for creative use in North Texas classrooms. She feeds the classroom teacher. What better way to, to live a life? And next, Daphne Barlow Stiglianos, which I've known for a long time. We shared a child in our history, her child at Kids Who Care. She was first introduced to the Boys and Girls Clubs as a volunteer. 1998 is the best way to learn how to manage something in the future. She was hired first to answer the phone. That's your best bet for a future CEO. And to do data entry and progressively tackled a variety of roles and advanced in the organization. In 2006, after a national executive search, a national search for a Daphne, they realized there she was. And she was appointed CEO and president of the Boys and Girls Clubs of Greater Fort Worth. In late 2018, the Boys and Girls Clubs of Greater Fort Worth to Herrick County was formed. She was named CEO and President. This youth development organization, which I think most of us realize, but I didn't realize, served 31,000 young people and has expanded to, Den expanded to Denton County. It's both the oldest and the largest of its kind in the state of Texas. Congratulations. In 1998, Daphne graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Microbiology from Oklahoma State University. And in later 2000, she completed her master's degree in public health and public health management from the University of Next North Texas. Welcome, Daphne. And our moderator, Elliot Goldman actually had in his bio something I've always wondered, always wondered since I met him, who are you, Elliot Goldman, really? If you've been a member of this club over the last 26 years, you know him as a former board member, and I can only imagine his newscasts. If you're a resident of Westover Hills, you might know him for serving as a councilman and the current pro tem, mayor pro tem, didn't know that, Elliot. And if you're part of promotional products industry, you would know him as the CEO of the second largest supplier of non-disposable and imprint, imprint able bags in the US. If you're part of government and the political world, you might know him as the former campaign Capitol Hill and White House staff, White House staff, which is exceedingly interesting to know who he's had conversations with. And if you're part of the humanities world, you know him as a museum curator an author of three books. Who are you, Elliot Goldman? <laughs> and finally, if you know him as I do, as the head of a nonprofit, the founder of the greatest gift catalog, and quite honestly, at the end of the day, a really great friend. Welcome, Elliot. All the microphones working, just check real quick. Thank you. I, I told her not to let Trudy a good story, so uh, I. Can you, you guys can hear me? Okay, great. Uh, when Sean asked me a couple of days ago to put together a program, I said, what do you want me to talk about? She said, talk about 30 minutes, but it's not true. We get about 20. So I'm super excited. For those of you who don't uh, know what the Greatest Gift Catalog is, it's a holiday shopping guide that comes the fourth quarter of every year. It features 100 different programs, exciting programs that are going on in the community run by about 20 to 25 different nonprofits. And it talks about what they're doing and what their needs are in the community. You can also give through the catalog. We get about a quarter of a million dollars in matching funds every year. And those funds are raised and then uh, double your contribution to 
the organizations. But the interesting thing that it does for me as the lead volunteer is that about 50 up to, I should say, up to 50 organizations a year apply. So I get to see everything that's going on in the nonprofit community. And when the organizations that are in the catalog come in and they give us their projects, I get to see the most innovative and interesting things happening in the community. And so I thought it would be, it would spur some type of discussion to talk about, I, I, we, have, we have three amazing leaders here who you've just heard about, but also it's interesting, they do different things and they've done really amazing things in these programs. And so I thought it would be interesting for you guys to hear a little bit, just a snippet from them about what they're doing in the community and also what I find to be the real innovative factor. So I'm going to start with John since he's closest to me. One of the things I loved about Academy Four, they've been in the catalog a couple of years. Um, when a a, when a match happens, a mentoring match happens in a community, it used to cost roughly $5,000 to make a match between a mentor and a mentee. There's a lot of reasons that went into why that was kind of the average match. That was the number that um, Big Brothers Big Sisters used for years. And um, that seemed like a ton of money to me. And they're like, well, we've got to make sure that we've got to do these background checks and so on and so forth. So when John applied in the catalog for the catalog and we came and we talked to him, I said, what does it cost for a match? And he told me he'll give you the number. And I was just shocked. It was magnitudes of scale difference. And so, I, John, would you mind talking about that kind of and telling us a little bit about what you guys did, how you figured it out. But before that, if you don't mind, well, yeah, talk about that. And then I'm going to talk about what you guys do or where you guys have been in that program. But let's talk about the innovation first, because I don't know how much time we're going to have for each thing. Got you. OK. Um, and let me be clear. What we do is very, very different than Big Brothers and Big Sisters. But what we do is get more people in the community to be able to, to mentor than just about anything else I've seen. And it really comes from our founder and chairman, a local businessman, uh, his pastor told him, hey, you're generous with your resources, but go get your hands dirty. And he tried an every week mentoring program and he just failed at it. He was too busy. Um, he had meetings to go to. Uh, he'd have, you know, somewhere he had to travel to that just came up out of the blue. And, and, and he like, I'm doing more harm than good with this child. And so what do what do successful people do when they find a problem and, and when they have a disconfirming experience? Well, they come up with a solution. And so we really were founded on this intentionality of how can busy people make a big impact? And that's the key. Uh, he didn't want to do anything that wastes his time. Uh, and he didn't want to do anything that wastes waste the time of other people. So how can busy people make an impact in a shorter amount of time uh, and do it in a way that's that's really intentional? Um, and that more people can just show up and say yes to. And it was really teachers at, at Daggett Elementary where we started uh, that made Academy Four what it would be because uh, he just had that idea. He had this importance, this notion of the importance of fourth grade. That's probably a whole nother topic for a whole nother day. But uh, with those two things, we went in and started having some conversations and they're the ones who said, understand at a school like ours where 97% of the students are on free and reduced lunch, which is a pretty good indicator of, the, of poverty. Um, we don't have some at risk students are all at risk. So would you provide a mentor for every single one? That's insane. But that's what we've been doing now for 11 years uh, and started with 114 students at Daggett. We'll serve 3000 this year. But the, the numbers are different and the economics are different. And it's probably not fair because we're, we're really doing something different. Yet we are going to touch more students than any other kind of program of, of our nature that I know about uh, could be something out there that I don't know about, um, you know, with each uh, campus that we go on to. And so, and and the importance of that is um, there, there are programs out there for the most at risk students in a school like Daggett. And so hear what the teacher said, right? They said, we need a mentor for everyone because they're all at risk. Um, there's programs for the most at risk kids often, not always, but often. There's gifted and talented stuff for the kids that are doing really well. And let's just say gross rough math, 20% of the kids over here, 20% over there, 60 in the middle, that's not accurate, but let's just go with it for the moment. 
Just think about those 60% of the kids in the middle. Those are the ones that nobody's showing up for at all. And that's what the, that's what the Daggett teachers meant. So all of our kids are at risk and the 60% in the middle are ignored. And so that's what we do. We show up and most of those kids, they don't need a, a big intensive intervention. Most of them just need one more positive adult showing up and giving them a push in the right direction. And so that's what we do at the Academy for. So yeah, sure. Where is big brothers, big sisters, they're talking, you know, thousands of dollars. We talk in terms of a couple hundred dollars uh, to, to really get our students uh, a mentor and get them connected. So and I want, you're right, I needed to, I, I always, this is a huge mistake I make. I always assume everyone knows what you do. You've got an amazing program. Let me, let me, if you'll question before I move on to the next organization, you all, you all have leveraged churches in an amazing way to be able to gather more, um, more mentors and, uh, and help more people and use the leverage of those institutions that they already have where you have people that will pass background checks, et cetera, et cetera. So do you want to talk about that for just a minute also? Yeah, um, pragmatically, uh, we, we partner with churches because they're good at getting volunteers <laughs> and um, they're relatively stable forces in our community. Uh, and we need lots of volunteers. Uh, also, this was the organization was founded by people of faith. And so we also believe in the mission of local church to love their neighbors. And it's that simple. And we believe they can invite the rest of the community in to be a part of that. And they do. So just typically get about half or more of the mentors that we need. Um, and then they invite the community in to, to kind of be a part of that and go and serve with them. So it's a positive thing that churches can do in our community because many churches are out there doing some things that aren't as positive, right? I mean, yeah, some of y'all are like very sheepishly, yes. There's, there's sometimes some that, yeah, and, and, but this is something where they can be seen out in the community and, and like spearheading something that doesn't divide any of us. I mean, who, who can say no to going and loving on kids at an elementary school, right? We can all, I think, for the most part, agree on that. So that's what we do, and, we, and, and the churches, it gives them an on-ramp to really be uh, a positive force in the community and do more. Uh, so that's, that's, that's their angle on it, but from, from our end, um, we couldn't find a better partner. And, and to that point, 11 years, we've never gone into a school and left, and it's in no small part because of that local church and, and the way we partner with them. That's awesome. Taylor, I'm uh, excited. I always describe, uh, I'm sorry, I said Taylor, but Vanessa. We're the same. Oh, cool. It's, it's great. <laughs> Vanessa, I, whenever I, I get, I always try to come up with a five second for everybody. And for you, I always say, you're the food bank of stuff. And, um, and I, everybody now gets it. This is what she does. You can explain a little more in a little more detail what you do. But one of the things that I love about your organization is the leverage, the amount. It takes a little bit of money, but you can use that money with the donations, how much throughput you get. And then so if you don't mind talking a little bit about what, a, what you do, the leverage, okay? And then um, those two things, let's start with those two things. I might have one follow up for you. You got it, Elliot. Um, hello, thank you guys for having me and giving me a mic. This is your fault. Um, so at the Wellman Project, we uh, our mission is to fill a classroom, not a landfill. Um, what that means is we're trying to tackle two big issues in our community, and that's waste output generated by businesses and then lack of resources in our school with one crazy, cool, innovative idea, and that's creative reuse. So we literally have a warehouse um, that is on Vickery Boulevard next to Swiss Pastry Shop, just to give everyone a reference. And teachers come in and they can literally shop for whatever they need there's no limit to how they can how often they can shop how much they can take um, and it's all absolutely free to them we're collecting materials um, from large corporations we're collecting materials from smaller mom and pop shops and yes grandma's garage um, but we're really focused on those business relationships because um, that's where you're gonna get your bulk items that can serve more than just a classroom I think that um, our leverage is that anyone can get involved. Um, we came up with this crazy idea and we thought it was just going to be an adorable hobby while we figured out the rest of our life. Um, and we just saw a need and I think innovation really comes from that right kind of crazy where people are like, Psh, 
girl, that ain't gonna work. And we're like, but it might. Um, and then inviting everyone and to come along and making it inclusive and accessible, not just to the clients we serve, which are our teachers, but to all of you friendly folks who are donating things or getting out the word or telling a teacher, hey, you can get free supplies here, um, or shopping in our curiosity shop, which is open to the public. What was your other question? Oh, you got it. You okay. nailed it. All right. I'm going to give da I'm going to give Daphne a chance and then we're going to get back to how volunteers can help because there are a lot of people in here that like that stuff. So Daphne, I I've worked with Daphne now for 16 years, 15 years. I apologize. 15 years. We're not that old, but she's not that old. I'm old. So 15 years. One of the most, you know, what happens is, is when you're a longstanding institution in this community and you've got well-known brand recognition, People sometimes say, I know who they are, I know what they do, I know their mission, and so on and so forth. And every time I go over to Daphne's place, I try to check in with the organizations once a year, sometimes I'm a little lax, and it's every other year. Every time I go over there, I'm just blown away by what Daphne's doing. So last time I was in Daphne's office, I'm like, oh my God, the pandemic's crazy, what's going on? She goes, ah, we're just loading up buses and we're taking the clubs to the kids rather than having to come to the clubs. I said, oh my gosh, it's unbelievable. I go, why didn't even think of that before? She went, didn't have to. So anyway, so Daphne, could you just tell us a little bit about some of the iterations and things that you guys have got going on that are part of this core mission, but just haven't been done before? Thank you, Vanessa. Um, so first off, I just want to say we couldn't innovate or change if not for all the incredible help we've had to get to today. So uh, we will be celebrating 100 years as an organization in just uh, three years. So a lot of that comes from a lot of support from, from a lot of people, including people here in this room. So in, in the pandemic, uh, we never shut down. We never stopped. And one of the things that we learned really quickly is that people needed more from us. We opened our front doors and people came to us. Sometimes the lines uh, to get to the front of the, of the club, the Boys and Girls Club was a mile or two miles long. So it was clear to us that people needed our services, but in a different sort of way. So initially people came to us, but it became really clear that we could do more. Uh, you may have seen a Boys and Girls Club bus driving around town. These are the short white buses. Uh, we have a large fleet and we determined pretty quick, quickly that um, having that fleet parked during the pandemic was just a sad thing. They're supposed to be full of kids and uh, we, we, we thought we could do something more. So uh, really to answer your question, Elliot, one good idea led to another good idea. And so we filled our buses up with food first. Uh, and then we figured, you know what, we can take more than food. We can take the Boys and Girls Club. Uh, many of you have probably been inside of a Boys and Girls Club and you know, first off, they can be noisy places because they're full of kids having a great time. Uh, but they're also really enriching places that are meant to bring uh, uh, an opportunity for young people to learn, to grow, to have fun, to build relationships. And so our buses first got filled with those activities and with most importantly trained staff who have the ability to create experiences for kids. And so we would drive to communities uh, where there were no boys and girls clubs and where they were under resourced. And then we figured, you know what, let's not just stuff a bus, let's actually create amazing vehicles like RVs and sprinter vehicles that are specially designed to create these experiences. Uh, and that also led us to be more intentional, more strategic. We mapped our, our communities uh, for those parts of the community that were truly under-resourced, uh, but had high need. And so we've been able to expand now four teams with 10 vehicles. And now those, those teams rotate through our county and now Denton County offering services. Each team can serve 11,000 young people and we have four teams. And so a community that can't have a boys and girls club, that's a building, can have a mobile team. This concept um, is actually being imitated across the country. Uh, we all know that good things come from here. <laughs> and it's really amazing uh, to see this idea take off because it, it really is giving us the opportunity to serve a lot more kids at a much lower cost. So 
I have a hundred question, follow up questions. I hope they invite each one of you guys back to do your own presentation. But before we get to questions in the group, I want to find out that there are a lot of people. Could you guys talk a little bit each, a little bit about what volunteer opportunities there are, what kind of things people can do to get involved uh, with your organization? And we'll start at the, at the end again. But so we do need volunteers on a regular basis. Our website, you could just Google Boys and Girls Clubs of Greater Tarrant County. You'll see lots of opportunities. We need people. We need things. Uh, we need money. Those are the, the main things. This is a really big chair. I just want to point that out. Like, <laughs> um, uh, you look fantastic in that chair. I mean, I'm very, it's very loungy. I love it. I love, I love um, it. Yeah, volunteering. Um, we need people to help um, organize and sort. The sooner that we can get things out on the floor for teachers, the sooner they can be implemented in the classroom. But beyond that, we have a holistic approach to helping our teachers. It's not just stuff. It is support and resources. So. It's if you have a business um, that can sponsor a science trip or if you um, are a former teacher and you want to come and be a mentor to a teacher in our makerspace, if you if you know how to use a lathe, we have a lathe in our makerspace and we would love to teach our teachers how to use those tools. So really anything, we, we've had people who are older than Mr. So and as young as four come and volunteer with us. So join us. <laughs> I was just thinking I need a little bigger chair, but um, <laughs> I think it's the same chair. Yeah. Um, we don't exist without volunteers. Uh, you know, I mean, much like Daphne said, we need two things. I, I boil it down to: we need volunteers and money, and um, it's that simple. Uh, but without volunteers, we don't have a program, and so, but, and that's that's kind of been the key to making this thing work. Um, if you don't have good programming. Um, we don't have anything to begin with. Uh, so once we kind of built on those bones of like a really good program, people who help get this up and running from the start, uh, we really set out to say, how do we make this an easy experience for adults? Because most of you are scared to go on elementary school campuses. You just are, whether you're gonna admit it or not. Um, because you, you don't wanna look stupid. You, you're not sure what you're gonna say to a fourth grader maybe. You just, you just don't know what to do. Uh, so we try to make that as easy as we can for you. We're gonna send you the information ahead of time you won't read it most of you like um, you ma'am you might read it you know you sir I mean but y'all are about it you know um, I can kind of pick you out um, for the rest of you we're gonna tell you exactly what you need to do when you get there that notion of just-in-time learning uh, we have a we have a workbook for the students that you'll work book uh, work through every month you know Vanessa's not in because she's she's been a mentor in our program uh, but uh, you work through that workbook with your student it's a workbook for the kids but it's really a job aid for you because uh, it gives you everything that you need to be successful and so we try to create this easy experience where you can say yes because it's once a month it's 90 minutes and uh, you and, and you're only gonna have to come nine times during the school year but you're gonna know that every minute is valued and purposeful and and that you're doing something important because you're not just sitting there you're not just hanging out and figuring out what I do um, we do have unstructured time but even that has a plan a purpose and a structure to it you'll get some time to play board games and do some crafts and that kind of stuff but though all those minutes are very intentional and all about building relationship and so we even have a research-based framework baked into the program I don't have to teach it to you although we will you'll forget it but that's why we baked it into the program uh, so that we just make that experience super easy for you it, it's interesting I encourage you guys to look on these people's websites call or talk they are some of the most, in, not only the innovative people, they're managing hyper growth. These organizations are doing amazing things. John's growing. I mean, how many, how many people did you have last year and how many do you have this year? People? Uh, well, how many, how many students do you serve? Students? Oh, yeah. Students, we were at about uh, 20, a little over 2,000 this year. We're a little over 3,000. I mean, we basically, a number of schools, we saw 54% uh, growth. Uh, excuse me, in, increase over last year. But I'll say during the, the pandemic, you know, much like Daphne, um, we just listened to what our schools needed. And so we doubled in size during the two pandemic years. We didn't want to do that. We didn't need to do that. Uh, it was hard, but that's what the need was in the community. And so that's that's what we did. Yeah, and you're, so you're layering 50% growth on 200% growth. And Daphne's in an interesting situation in that, that when you're running something, good job running you could do a good job running and implementing a program there's a lot of consolidation people just want you to take their program over and so that 
consolidated, just so everybody knows, Daphne consolidated Arlington, right, and, and Fort Worth together, kept all the board members and kept everyone, I mean, it's amazing what they're doing that. And so it's, it's exciting and it, it's worth talking about. Do we have time for one question, Sean, or so? anybody have a question so that I... Can I say something? Yeah, oh yeah, please. Yeah. I think the thing that makes Fort Worth exceptionally innovative in the nonprofit space is that we're not competitors. We are partners. I Boys and Girls Club has shopped with us. Academy Four has shopped with us. We, our team has been mentors with them. I'm gonna come hang out in the RV, I don't know. So I think when we're talking here and when you see nonprofits in Greatest Gift Catalog or for North Texas Giving Day, realize that we're all rooting for each other. And if you help one organization, you're helping us all and we're gonna rope you in and then you will never leave. <laughs> That is awesome. It's, it's a great message. And yeah, there's a huge collaboration. And, and when you donate something to us and we don't know what to do with it, we give it to them. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> do we have one? Do we have one question over here? I saw somebody. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so we don't we don't determine that. We include every single student. Uh, it doesn't matter if they have learning disabilities. It doesn't matter if they have special needs. It doesn't matter if uh, they speak foreign language. Um, and and believe me, you're like, well, how do you get those mentors? I really don't know. Uh, we just we just put it the word out in the community. Uh, I believe God plays a hand in that and provides the people that we need and people show up. Uh, but we that that's the thing. We took that charge from those fourth grade teachers at Daggett very seriously when they said every one of our students needs a mentor. Um, you can't just pick them out from the herd and say these need you know because what most people don't realize there's a huge concentration of poverty in a lot of our our local elementary schools and with poverty comes trauma and increase just tra poverty alone brings trauma but then there's an increase of that trauma given the life circumstance that many of our students and families have and so and that trauma doesn't just stay in a neat little container that they carry with them every day it gets out all over everybody students teachers you know and and so there's a lot going on in these schools and we don't provide enough resources as a community in those schools let me tell you that um, and you'll see that if you show up uh, and that's what we do. We give people their who, and they want to come and see and do more and, and grow deeper in the community. So every kid's in, included, though. Thank you guys so much. I know I, I like to stay on time. So I gotta... Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all so much. What a, what a problem to have. What a bountiful meeting we've had today. So many special components and so many outstanding speakers. Thank you all. Thank you for the work you do in our community with our children, most of all. And it is a tradition of the Rotary Club of Fort Worth that we make a donation in each of your honor uh, to this, right now we're doing it, to the Polio Plus Fund for Rotary International. Thank you again for being here with us today. And to, in the interest of time, I will also say I want to thank our sponsor, Randall Howard. R.D. Howard Roofing is part of R.D. Howard Construction, based in Fort Worth since 1946. R.D. Howard Roofing does hail and storm damage claims for homeowners, churches, apartments, and businesses with free roof inspections. Refer someone, and R.D. Howard will pay pay you or donate to your favorite nonprofit, which is this Rotary Club. <laughs> Call Tracy Marshall, 817-729-6314. Thank you, Mr. Jack Stowe, for your incredible neighbor, naval service. What a privilege to have you with us today. We are indebted to you and those that served. God bless you, sir. We are finishing up the Unleash the Beast. You may know that PBR, um, the World Finals, moved their World Finals from Las Vegas to Fort Worth last year. This is year two. Your Rotary Club is out there tomorrow. Come join us. We'll be in the stockyards for the parade. There's also a special meet and greet for Brazilian VIPs at the Texas, uh, actually it's at the paint, um, I'm not sure where it is, the Paint, the Paint Horse Association. <laughs> but we're doing this in conjunction with Visit Fort Worth, the Fort Worth Hispanic Chamber, the Texas Cowboy Hall of Fame, American Paint Horse Association, and um, among others. Ryla, if we need a van, we've got five kids. If anybody has a van, talk to Akua uh, and Yanful. Um, yeah, we, we've got five kids plus one to two drivers to escort them back and forth to Stephenville. 
Fa fabulous. Mr. Howard, thank you. We do have a board of directors meeting today, President's Conference Room 11th floor. Remember, no meeting next Friday in honor of Memorial Day. Kathy, please hand me that paper on top. What? My lap, my page four. <clears throat> okay, this is, you got to hear this. Next week, well, two weeks, June 2nd, Going With Heart, Southwest Airlines looks ahead to the next 50 years. Ryan Green, EVP and Chief Commercial Officer of Southwest Airlines. That's also the 110th anniversary of the signing of our club charter. You must be there. June 9th, we're planning ahead. We wanna make sure that you know to bring your guests. We have the three congresspersons coming that day. We've got Kay Granger, a member of this club, Roger Williams, a member of this club, and Jake Elsey. That will be special. Finally, since 1775, over 1 million men and women have died defending the United States. And since the Civil War era, Days of remembrance for fallen soldiers have been celebrated across our country. In 1968, the federal government officially designated Memorial Day in May. On this day, we must tell the stories of those who fought and died in freedom's cause. We must tell their stories because those who've lost loved ones need to know that a grateful nation will always remember. We must tell their stories so that our children and grandchildren will understand what our lives might have been like had it not been for their sacrifice. This meeting is adjourned. Have a wonderful week and weekend.